Welcome to the Connect with County Leaders podcast with your host, Brian Hill. Hello and welcome to the Connect with County Leaders. I'm Brian Hill. On this special public safety focused edition of the podcast, I'm joined with Chief Kevin Davis, Fairfax County Police Department, and Chief John Butler, Fairfax County Fire and Rescue Department. How are you guys doing? I'm great. Great. Yeah. Great. Congrats on your show. Big show. Big show, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, yeah. wait till I ask you these questions, <laughs> and then we can have the congratulations after, maybe. <laughs> sure, yeah. All right? But, guys, I have to say this. Uh, this county is very blessed to have both of you. Um, we are looking at data-informed decisions and integrating data into programs and services, which leads to stronger public safety in Fairfax County. You guys have been absolutely fantastic. Share with us some of the examples of your progress, and we'll start with Chief Davis, and then we'll get to Chief Butler. Thank you, Mr. Hill. I'm glad you said data informed as opposed to data driven because we are better informed uh, than, than ever, both police and fire. One of the things that we've done well at for a number of years is sharing our arrest data, our traffic enforcement data, our person stop data, but we've taken it to another level in 2023 and we're using our new threat assessment mm -hmm. management personnel to identify persons who are on a pathway to violence and we're intervening more often than than we than we ever have so all too often police departments are on the right side of boom as opposed to the left side so whether it's the threat assessment management focus that we have now or whether it's the emergency substantial risk order focus that we have in fairfax county uh, we know people in mental health and behavioral crisis are prone to acts of violence so we're intervening more often and earlier than we ever have before. So our co-responder model is what you're getting to. So why don't we, before we get to Chief Butler, why don't we talk a little bit about the co-responder model and then we'll juxtapose that to Chief Butler because he's also a part of that. So Kevin, why don't you keep teasing out yeah. the co-responder model? Yes, sir. So as of October 31st, and we're catching up and by the end of this year, we'll have our full 2023 data, but our four co-responder teams have interacted on 1,800 calls for service. And on half of those calls for service, the issue was mitigated right there at the scene with a police officer and a trained clinician. Uh, the other half of those encounters resulted in a higher level of care and diversion. So uh, we're not putting our handcuffs on people in crisis anymore. We're diverting them to the right uh, place so they, can, so they can simply get better. I thank you for that. And Chief Butler, data informed, co-responder model. Where are you guys uh, in fire and rescue with that? So those two topics, uh, data and um, meeting the, the community where they are mm -hmm. in, on this side of boom <laughs> or some other uh, ways to uh, visualize that is very important. You know, uh, oftentimes the, the person calling 911 may not be needing an emergency service or an emergency care, or we have to, uh, super, our super utilizers usually have to be referred to others. Mm -hmm. So by putting these resources, law enforcement, and um, you know, social uh, work uh, uh, professionals and other professionals alongside with fire and EMS personnel, we can find the right place for those who need help. Um, our super utilizer uh, community, if you will, those that we see often um, typically need something more than a splint or a Band-Aid or, or, or oxygen. So um, using data, we're starting to identify areas and, pers and people, specific people who could use different services other than emergency medical service. You know, when you, the way you speak about that, it's like risk reduction, right? right? We're doing a better job on risk reduction. Tell us, talk to us about what your mindset is about risk reduction as well as how we move into the future because every day we change. Sure. COVID has brought us something, right? Not only did we get sick with COVID, but we got, we got better with COVID in my view because we become data informed. We're looking at risk reduction. What are the other things that we're doing with fire and rescue and question. police? I, I love talking about risk reduction, you know, in the fire service and law enforcement. We use those three words together, community risk reduction mm -hmm. uh, in many, many ways. But the risk in some areas of the community Fairfax is different from other areas. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, recently we uh, distributed, you know, hundreds of smoke alarms in the Audubon community, and we'll continue doing that throughout the, throughout the Fairfax County community as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, using data and, and focusing 
heat maps in, in small boxes who needs what um, ass assistance in risk. Um, you know, we're, we're doing that. We have the Pulse Point app, which um, ties the subscriber to the emergency service. So if someone's having a heart attack um, and they call, their you know, bystander, CPR, and AED that can uh, be applied before we get there, again, to reduce that risk. That's just a couple of examples, and there, there are a few others. But right, right now, the one we've done in the last couple of weeks was a smoke alarm. Right. And uh, we'll continue doing that uh, across the county. Chief? So what, one of the ways we've reduced risk in Fairfax County, coming out of COVID, we had a really challenging 2022 with motor vehicle deaths and pedestrian deaths being at a, a very high, unacceptable level. In 2023, we introduced smarter traffic enforcement, uh, where crashes happen, happen more often, either with vehicles or pedestrians. And we're going to end 2023 with a dramatic reduction in vehicle fatalities, pedestrian fatalities, and our enforcement. Uh, and it's not for enforcement for the sake of enforcement. It's, it's enforcement to change driving behaviors. as is at an all time high. So one of the things that law enforcement has spoken about for years is aggressive driving. And up until recent years, aggressive driving used to mean three things, tailgating, unsafe lane changes, and speeding. Mm -hmm. Well, now we've added a fourth category and that's distracted driving. Mm -hmm. So we've been really intentional in forcing uh, Virginia laws as it, uh, as it pertains to uh, being on your cell phone and texting while driving, that's just as dangerous as driving while intoxicated. So um, we've introduced to our entire police department as well in terms of risk reduction, uh, naloxone or, or Narcan is the brand name to intervene when someone is suffering from a, a fatal overdose. And Fairfax County, like the rest of America, is challenged by the, um, the influx of fentanyl into our community. So uh, whenever we can reduce risk, just like fire and rescue, we really follow their lead. They're much better at it than we are, but we're realizing the value in risk reduction and doing a better job. And as you know, uh, our countywide strategic plan is focusing on public safety. And you two gentlemen have been very, very good partners in detailing where we are and what we're doing. And I really appreciate that. But from an internal standpoint, something that really, really dear to my heart was well fit. Tell us how that is helping our troops better serve our community. I'll start with you, Chief. Okay, so before I answer that, I do want to end with the risk reduction and say sure. um, risk reduction is also an equity uh, connection. There's right. an equity connection. Right. And um, with regard to one Fairfax, mm -hmm. that's another way of, of, of cementing or calcifying the work in one Fairfax by doing risk reduction it should not matter where in the county you live that gets the same services from police and fire as other areas. So the risk reduction uh, platform has to be very focal and organic and local because that too is equity. Um, so now pivoting to the question well, you let's, asked. Well, let's, okay. let's stay there for a minute okay. because you know, when you look at One Fairfax, you look at, as you say, risk reduction, but you also look at community health. Right, right. And that is why I was leaning gleaning into the well fit to get to okay. how it all corp incorporates together. But I, I appreciate you saying what you just said. Why don't we get to yeah. that question and then I'm gonna come back to how, in my vision, our vision, I hope it's our vision, how one Fairfax fits into our countywide strategic plan, as well as all of the good things you're doing with risk reduction and well fit and taking care of fire and rescue as well as the police department. Okay. So let's talk about well fit. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Um, 25 years ago, there were, there were 20 fire departments across, the, maybe it was 10, it was 10 fire departments across the, um, America that got together and started the Wellness Fitness Initiative. All right. 10 of us, and I could name them, Phoenix, Indianapolis, and many, and a handful of others, 10 of us came up with this compact. Part of that compact was to establish a wellness center. Mm -hmm. um, both occupational health and fitness, and uh, we we've committed to that. We've been uh, we've been disciplined and dedicated to it, and now it's actually grown and become even bigger and more more uh, uh, useful for all public safety. Right. And uh, capacity has been built thanks to our partners in, in in the police department who've contributed. 
and uh, both thought and and dollars uh, to making well our well fit facility uh, something we're really proud of and we're just starting. Uh, uh, the chief and I have talked a lot about you know where we want to take it and where we go with it. Um, it's a piece, right? The fitness, phys physical fitness is a component, behavioral health and mental health, um, as well as, uh, you know, occupational health. And we can talk about that. We're doing ultrasound uh, screening, ultra sc uh, ultrasound screening yeah. to find um, occupational or expo occupational cancers and some other things. Um, so I don't want to stay on that soapbox by myself. It's something we're both real proud of. Uh, from where we started and where we're going, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to add some to it. Thanks, Chief. And Mr. Hill, just today, uh, fire and police are hosting another large agency that knows about the successes we're having with WellFit, and uh, they're benchmarking what we're doing in Fairfax County. So I believe, uh, like you alluded to and Chief Butler stated, if you're mentally, psychologically, and physically fit, you're going to have much better interactions with those we serve in the community because we interact with people, both police and fire, who are on their worst day, um, a person's in crisis, a family's in crisis, a community's in crisis, and our capacity to interact with people in a calm, measured way depends a lot on our, our fitness, our overall fitness. So one thing police departments have historically been good at, at least during the three and a half decades of my career, <laughs> is focusing on psychological fitness uh, for cops. Uh, fire, on the other hand, has been better than the police at physical fitness and conditioning and, and, and diet and nutrition. So we've combined forces in Fairfax County, police and fire, and we absolutely have the number one wellness program yeah. in the country. And I want to say to both of you, because I'm, you know, I'm proud, I, I, I was on the, in, I helped hire both of you. I'll just say that. I said help. Not, I didn't hire both of you. I helped hire both of you. And your working together has been wonderful, wonderful to see because we are, as Chief Butler said, a one Fairfax concept. And you coming on board, working with FRD to make wellness and well-fit a seamless interaction between the two. When I first came to Fairfax County, fire worked out here, police worked out there. Now I see them together because we are one. And when we respond to a scene, we are one. It's not fires over there and we have to work together. And you guys have made this an absolute better place. And I thank you for both of that. Um, but when you, when you talk about the synergy between the two, staffing, right? We hear a lot of numbers about staffing. More numbers than I want to get into. But I'm going to give you the opportunity to tell us where we are from a staffing perspective. I think I'm going to start with you, Chief Davis. Um, how are you getting along with staffing, and how have you brought upon the, the ethos and the ethics and the integrity of One Fairfax as you've moved forward? Well, Mr. Hill, we changed our way of doing business. Like you alluded to earlier, COVID has required us to think differently. So we're thinking differently about how we hire police officers. And from the different thinking that's underway in Fairfax County. We've just put together our two largest police academy classes in a decade. Uh, we're up against uh, some attrition issues, and mm -hmm. it's it's a in the mid 1990s there was a national hiring push for police officers, and those baby cops from the mid 1990s are suddenly in their early to mid 50s, and they're naturally at retirement age. So we're focused on. Uh, retention. Mm -hmm. We're focused on hiring the right people who have a capacity to serve. And we have a leadership team that's literally th the best analogy I can use. And I love sports analogies. We're treating our police applicants like, like high school, college athletes. Um, we, we have a signing day for them. Uh, we make it a big deal to m maintain contact with them, whether it's text. Young people love to text. Um, <laughs> so so we're, we're staying in touch more and better with our police applicants because these young uh, people, they'll, they'll apply to four or five police departments right. at once. Right. And what we found is whoever treats them with the most respect and interest um, is, is the one who's going to prevail. Well, I'm going to ask you this before I let Chief Butler speak. Um, before we get to NIL, let me know so I can <laughs> name, image, and likeness. Let me know because we can't do that, okay? I'm just, yeah, I'm just yeah. forewarning you right now, okay, Chief? You're worth a couple million at least. Oh, I geez. might be good for a couple hundred. <laughs> 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 Chief, 
Chief Butler. Um, many industries are having staffing issues, and the fire and emergency medical service is no, no, not, not immune to that. Um, it is a challenge mm -hmm. in, in a, in a economic market that's relatively, you know, stable. People don't t tend to come towards public safety in these com in these markets. You know, recessions and other things that folks uh, and unemployment rates go up, they tend to come to government work. Right now, uh, we do have challenges across the country, nurses, teachers, uh, uh, paramedics, and everything else. But our, our community doesn't want that to be my answer. Like, okay, so we, we have a shortage of firefighters and EMTs, and therefore that's that. So that's separate. What we're doing, using that same data we've talked about, is reimagining what the workforce looks like. Mm -hmm. We're just as committed as ever to make sure we have the right person with the right skills on a right call at the right time. All right, that is an efficient gold standard. Okay, to ensure that we have to start with, you know, the front end, the 911 call, the emergency uh, uh, medical pr protocols, mm -hmm. the EMD dispatch protocols. Right. You know, 911, what's your emergency? Let's get that right and we'll dispatch the right resource. So we're doing some of that. Um, we're also uh, uh, using data to, to help us select and, and recruit. Uh, we're doing four uh, quarterly schools, quarterly recruit schools, once every three months. Now, when you, you know, I, I visited, a, I was a keynote at, a, at another uh, fire chief's uh, graduation recently, mm -hmm. and I was really impressed with what they had done. They had, you know, 60, 60 graduates, 60 graduates, but they run one school a year. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm really proud that we're the only ones around here until this broadcast, once I say it and others will start doing it. But uh, we do um, quarterly schools, mm -hmm. one every uh, quarter. So if I do, if I'm fortunate to have 20 in each school, that's 80 that year. That's right. Okay. Now, sometimes we can hit that, sometimes we don't. Right. What we're not doing is uh, lowering or changing our requirements and qualifications. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be so... Um, you know, pressed that we start to take uh, people that will bring uh, public trust to question. So uh, we're working hard. We've got a lot of work to do. We're not there, but uh, but I'm assuring that what we do have, the workforce we do have, we get them to the right call at the right time. I'm going to stay with you for a minute because you stated that um, we're looking at operationalizing and getting better. And there's a lot of scuttlebutt about ALS and BLS yes. and why we're moving forward with um, a different mindset or mm -hmm. a different change in how we provision a service, but you're still getting the same service, the same best top service. Yes. Speak about sure. the change that you are putting forward. So the data shows that when we had quite a bit of paramedics um, at a different time and under different conditions, mm -hmm. our time where the paramedic was at bedside next to someone who needed a paramedic has not changed. It has not changed much. Right. It's negligible. Um, is, it, is, it, is it perfect? No. But what we are committing to is there's a paramedic in every station. There is a par paramedic on many pieces of equipment. Some equipment that were traditionally a, uh, a paramedic unit has now turned into a basic unit. But that doesn't mean paramedics are not available. Right. We're, still, we're still doing that. We just two weeks ago started a, what we call EMS specialist, where we do have a specialist on each shift that can kind of, um, kind of surge capacity, surge capacity to places and times where we could use another set of hands um, and, and we'll continue building these things. We're, we're doing a inside internal paramedic school as well. We've been doing that for quite a right, while, right. but we're going to continue, um, you know, um, em emphasizing that in, in, with, in concert with uh, VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University, and the paramedic program there. Okay. So. That, that's, uh, that's awesome because I'm glad that we're able to, to articulate all the things you guys sent me to sign that nobody knows and nobody sees. This is our opportunity to say we're doing the work for the residents as well as we are funded through the Board of Supervisors in, to a place where we are doing it the best. Everybody looks at us when we do our business here in Fairfax County. It's a testament to you and to the, to the, to the women and men of the fire and rescue as well as the police. It is about us being excellent. So I, wanna, I really appreciate the way you've said that. But if I ask the police chief, Chief Davis, three years, where do you see us? Uh, doing much better with persons in, in crisis, mm -hmm. uh, being much better at uh, intercepting someone who's on a pathway to, to violence. I think a lot of times when someone commits an act of violence, we sit around all too often 
And, and we're not surprised by who that person is because that person is literally waving a red flag. <laughs> and and we're, sure. we're, we're not paying attention to people who sure. need not necessarily, not, not necessarily law enforcement attention, but attention from, from someone in government or schools or faith-based. And I think as we move forward as, as a post-COVID society, we have learned those hard lessons. And uh, putting handcuffs on, on a problem doesn't make it go away. And, and having said it, we've had a great 2023. We, our police department reflects the community in terms of gender and race better than we ever have. We have a long way to go. Um, and we've we've plummeted in some high-profile uh, areas that the community cares about: uh, fatal crashes, uh, uh, homicides, robberies, burglaries. Uh, our Achilles heel that we have to, you know, work collaboratively with the business community and um, the prosecutor's office is to get a hold of organized retail crime. Correct. That's the 2024 issue that 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 I'm really focused on. And to also focus in on, we've had these conversations about seniors and getting them to understand about the cyber attacks that they receive and not being gullible to just a text message. And we really promoted the fact that we need you all and their, their children to understand what's happening just by that, that phone is something else. Absolutely. Gets us in a lot of trouble. But yeah. Chief, how about, how about the three years for you? What, what, what do we look like in three years? We, uh, first and foremost, I want to make sure we are taking care of the workforce that I do have. Mm -hmm. We spend a lot of time talking about those who aren't here. Um, I want to focus on those who are here and, and make sure, you know, it's, mission and morale is a continuous circle. Yes, it is. Okay, it's a continuous symbiotic circle. Um, I, I do want to, in the next three years, find ways where we're not mandatory holding people in, uh, over time and uh, making, there are times where, you know, it's hard to recruit when we're not you know, when we're sending our recruiters out of here to go and find others to refer, and they're not really happy. Mm -hmm. So we have to take care of the workforce we do have. In the next three years, I do want to look at our service delivery. And are we um, mission, which will always be priority. Absolutely. Mission is meeting uh, the employee and the workforce at a, at a crossroads where we can both continue doing what we do and take care of them. We've touched on some of that, mental health. Um, wellness and fitness and making sure that we're giving them the best gear and equipment and putting them in the safest apparatus. Um, something to brag about when, when I say go forth and bring your friends yeah. to work for us, yeah. they should be proud of that. So uh, yeah, the next three years is continuing to analyze using data on what's working and what's not. What are we saying yes to? What are we not saying yes to or meeting others to help us you know, solve some issues? I, I thank you for that. So. I'm going to give you each about a minute or two to, to close off, close out this, this show. What's on your mind, Chief, that the residents of Fairfax County might want to hear from the, the best police chief in the yes. United States of America? Yes. Yeah. I said it. We heard you. Okay. <laughs> we could just end the show right yeah, now. Right, right, right. <laughs> no. uh, so so we, we have many successes and, and a lot of momentum uh, right now. It's um, like Chief Butler said. We, we do talk a lot about recruiting because it is so important, but sometimes our incumbent personnel need to know that we're really talking about them as well. So uh, police departments that fail try to be all things to all problems, and we can't be successful that way. So right. whether it's working with, with the schools or with the community services board or with the faith community, we have to find uh, and continue to seek innovative solutions to what ails our society. And a lot of it right now just has to do with mental and behavioral right. health. Um, and the vast majority of violence in Fairfax County, and Fairfax County is the largest, safest jurisdiction in America, but our violence occurs inside homes. Right. Uh, so you know, how do we as a society get, get a better read on crisis inside, inside the home? And, and I'm convinced the faith community um, has, has a role to play there. So it's up to us to, to strengthen that, that relationship. And you know, you say that as well as the community in general, you know, growing up in urban areas, we always had our head on a swivel. We looked, we saw, we spoke. We need to do more speaking to each other because it seems as though everybody's put their heads down into that phone and they forget about the outside world. And that's something that we really have to work on, better articulation and better understanding of people. Um, Chief? 
there are things that we should all be proud of. I, I'm really proud of what the Fire and Rescue Department has done. Um, our USAR team, yeah. every, uh, everyone, uh, a lot of people know about the Virginia Task Force One. We were able, in the last five years, able to obtain another contract, uh, an extended contract with our federal partners. Um, we were accredited, again, as an accredited agency. We're single digits across the country that are accredited fire and rescue departments. Um, our VCU partnership, what we're doing with paramedics, uh, our data analytics strategies mm -hmm. team, that's novel and that's leading the way. Um, if I sit here and kind of go through, I can find six to ten things that put us clear in the running to be the leader in the, U in the U.S. fire service. I get to see a few fire departments every now and then. And uh, we're, we're really leading. We're leading the, um, the industry. And I'm proud to be in the seat when this is happening. And so should be our board. And so should you and Deputy County Exec Tom Arnold. We got a good thing going here. And uh, I am biased, but I also get to see and compare with others. That's the NIL money right there. Yeah, I, you know, there you, you guys, you, you guys are always in my pocket, so it's all good. I appreciate that. But I, I just want to say this. Let's make a deposit. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would appreciate that. But having great leadership like you are makes my life a lot less traumatic and I really want to appreciate appreciate you both because prior to you coming Chief Butler and prior to you coming Chief Davis uh, the world wasn't as good as it is today so I want to say thank you to both of you and let the residents know that they have really good leadership here at Fairfax County well that's going to do it for this special public safety focus episode of the connect with county leaders podcast my thanks to Kevin Davis Chief Davis thank you and to John Butler from the fire and rescue department for sharing joining us joining us and sharing all the exciting new and happenings with our police and fire and rescue department without you guys we can't make it work so we really want to say thank you and again thanks to you for being here i look forward to talking with you again next month with the connect with county leaders guys awesome appreciate you and thank you so much for all you do 